Okay, let me let Samantha in. Okay, I think that's everybody. Okay, now let me try assigning hosts. <laughs> Okay, Amanda, I'm gonna make you the host and then from there you could take it and make folks co-host. Great. Do you need to pause the recording? Oh, good call. Okay, well, welcome to section, session 2H at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. My name is Amanda Zarang. I use she, her pronouns and I'm the manager of digital services at Texas Women's University and a member of the TCDL planning committee. I am pleased to be your session moderator today. First, some housekeeping. Texas Digital Library and the TCDL planning committee are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. We ask that everyone here today be considerate and respectful in speech and action, attempt to collaboration before conflict, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory or harassing behavior and speech, and be mindful of your environment and of your fellow participants. You can also view our code of conduct on the homepage of the conference. This session will run approximately 50 minutes and end at 3.50. Please feel free to take breaks as you need. I invite you to say hello and chat and let us know where you're joining from, share resources, and make comments throughout today's presentations. You are also encouraged to post your questions in the Q&A section where you can also vote on other questions that you'd like our speakers to answer. Um, Alex and I will be watching for your questions in Q&A and share them with our speakers during Q&A at the end. And now on with the show, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Robert Weaver. I will hand things over to you to get the show started. All right, thanks, Amanda. Um, if y'all will give me a moment, we're gonna go ahead and share this screen. There we go. Well, um, as Amanda said, I'm Robert Weaver, I'm uh, the chair of Texas Archival Resources Online, and I appreciate the opportunity that TCDL has given me to, to speak on Tarot's behalf um, today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a massive project that we've been working on um, over the last several years uh, and jump right into it. First off, what is Texas Archival Resources Online? Many of you may not know. Uh, it's a consortium of over uh, 70 archives, museums, and cultural heritage centers throughout Texas. It provides a mutually supported website based at UT Libraries for member repositories to upload archival finding aids. Now, if you don't know what a finding aid is, and some of you may not, um, it's basically an archival document, whether electronic or physical, that is an inventory of an archival collection, box by box, item by item, et cetera, combined with some collection level metadata that uh, gives our researchers a sense of what a collection may hold and whether or not they need to use it. That could contain biographical information of the creator of the collection, how many boxes are in the collection, and all that other good types of metadata you may be familiar with as well. So for over two decades, Tarot has served as a free and open resource for both archivists and our researchers um, that holds now 16,000 finding aids visited by hundreds of thousands of researchers per year that you can find um, actually at the URL listed, uh, the first URL right now, and the much better URL, txarchives.org, starting a little bit later in the year, and that's part of what I'm about to tell you about. However, a couple more notes. While Tarot is housed from a technical standpoint, at UT Libraries, it's actually governed by an elected steering committee. That includes the chair, me, uh, our vice chair, uh, the immediate past chair, a secretary, three at-large members, and uh, a permanent representative of UT Libraries. This is a group that handles all the matters of governance and uh, top-level decision-making on behalf of our many repositories. 
Now, we have a bunch of subcommittees. They're listed here. They do what it says on the tin, pretty much. Funding seeks grants and ways to fund our projects. Uh, governance handles bylaws, revisions, outreach, and education. It's pretty obvious what they do. Uh, our standards committee focuses on metadata standardization for repositories. Our web tech committee is actually currently overseeing uh, user experience and functionality testing for various aspects of the new website we're making that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And then we have a newly created authorized terms subcommittee that's uh, created as a part of this project. Um, they're going to coordinate subject headings and their relationship to searching and browsing on the new site. And then finally, we have our Summerly new member initiative uh, funded by the Summerly Foundation. Um, it recruits new members and assists them with the creation of finding aids um, for those repositories that may not have the resources to do so themselves. And hey, clicked on the wrong thing. There we go. Okay, so we have this amazing infrastructure that I just uh, described. What am I here to talk to you about today? Well, in short, many years ago, uh, we ran into a problem with the site, which is that it was 20 some odd years out of date. It was obsolete. Many of the functions listed here, and no doubt several others, were decades old, um, but some visuals might better capture some of uh, the obsolescence I'm talking about. This right here, is the search results you'd get today if you were to search for cowboy music on the site. Um, the displays is fairly abominable. You can't really get a sense of what you're looking at or, or why it came up in the search results. And this was a common researcher and archivist um, complaint over the years. Once you got into one of our finding aids, you would see this massive document display sort of laid out very um, late 20th century. Um, this is an example of the top level metadata in this finding aid. And there are tons and tons of it to scroll through just to get to the inventory. Um, and those headings on the left side of this image, they're actually uh, ways to get you to the inventory, but they don't follow you down the page. It's very hard to hop back and forth between portions of this page. And when you get down to the inventory itself, um, some collections may contain I think this collection contains 40 boxes, some contain 400, 600 boxes. And navigating through this inventory was a chore as well. A lot of scrolling, a lot of control F um, and other things that uh, didn't make a very pleasant research experience. And then last but not at all least um, was the frustration of a total lack of mobile device usability. This, liter uh, this image is literally a screen cap from my phone. Uh, it cannot convey the, the frustrating experience of using Tarot on a mobile device. Some of the other issues that we had that led to the project I'm going to be talking about were improperly coded and inconsistent or non-standardized metadata, an FTP file upload system that was cumbersome and typically required education and training for our repositories even to use it. And then uh, inscrutable and often inaccurate uh, usage statistics and other onboard metrics. And then finally, it was just uh, aesthetically unappealing. It was time to make this thing look good. So now, Tarot's steering committee, numerous volunteers alongside the institutional home, UTL, UT libraries, are within months of debuting a new site. And I'm going to tell you about how that happened, but also about the uh, roadblocks and challenges that we met along the way that can hopefully uh, help you if you ever wind up in a large consortial website creation situation. So we began all of this work with an NEH planning grant back in, I believe, 2015, 2016. Um, where we dug into the basic ideas that you'd hope to see in a, a planning grant funded by the NEH. Um, I won't delve into all of the things we researched too deeply. You can see a list of them here. But generally, uh, we looked at a collection development policy, which in uh, the context of Taro meant a way to attract new members and increase and enhance the contributions of existing members. We formalized the governance structure that I touched on earlier and research sustainability models, such as a fee structure for people to join and remain in Terra. We did not implement that, and I think that was a good idea. We created a standardized metadata document uh, to guide repositories in making finding aids. That's the best practice guidelines listed here. And uh, really all of this created 
a knowledge base and a sketch of tasks and responsibilities that pave the way to the current grant that we're operating under, the Humanities Collections and Reference Resources Implementation Grant, or what we call Tarot to the 21st century. We also call it Taro 2.0. We got a lot of names for it, but what it all boils down to is a full-blown front and back-end website redesign approaching our different problems from every possible angle. There were specific functionality requirements we wanted to achieve. I already listed those for you, but we also wanted the logo, the color palette, everything about the site to reflect a more modern aesthetic while still capturing the spirit of our archival mission and our 70 different repositories. But we also, while we didn't know the full scope of what this meant at the time, uh, we wanted to utilize existing and new metadata to make items more discoverable and accessible. For example, we needed to revise our subject headings to align with requirements of the new browse and search functions of the site. We built this basically around hiring a metadata analyst, Devin Murphy is gonna be presenting tomorrow a little bit about more, a little more about what uh, this subject heading project entailed. But we also wanted to explore eventual conversion to EAD3. So as an aside, for those who don't know, finding aids, the metadata standard is encoded archival description or EAD. We currently use a version called EAD 2002, but a newer standard EAD3 exists. And it's something that we believe that archives and consortia like ours should be prepared to implement in the next few years. And then of course we needed to train our repositories uh, and our researchers on the new site. So look, that's all simple enough, right? It's a lot of work, of course, but we have a well-defined uh, set of strategic goals with sub goals and tasks and all the things you need to uh, create and succeed in a project like this. But of course it wasn't so simple. Um, the project began with a day long all hands meeting uh, as so many of these do when they're this large. Uh, this contained our stakeholders like myself and other volunteers, uh, UT libraries, developers, and probably others. There were sure a lot of people there uh, who pooled their ideas and resources to iron out what uh, the new site would do based on what we'd put in the grant, what I've shared already today. And this is when some dissonance occurred between archivists' ideas and developer terminology and understanding of how a project like this work began. Um, for example, Things that our repositories and researchers wanted were articulated by the stakeholders to the developers, just like you do. And then the developers articulated that back in their technology until we all created uh, a useful minimum viable product document or in layman's terms, it's a schematic of what the developers promised to give us no matter what. And so we left the all hands meeting, work began more or less, but there were things that were covered in that meeting about which, at least from the archivist side, um, both groups uh, didn't know that the other side didn't understand. For example, uh, most stakeholders who attended the, uh, the all hands meeting had a poor understanding of the agile project management system. Now, if you don't know what that is, neither did we. <laughs> so in short, it's a system to manage large scale IT projects. Um, under that system, the final product that's being developed falls under the supervision of what's called a, a product owner, uh, whose job among many other things is to describe requirements as stakeholders understand them to the squad created under Agile. Squad is an amazing word. Our squad is called the Valkyrie squad, which I love every time I read it. Um, so this product owner is explaining to Valkyrie squad what uh, the specifications of the MVP mean in uh, archival terms and then uh, taking info from the developers back to us, the stakeholders and coordinating that whole thing. So we knew, we didn't know all that at first. What we knew is that there was a product owner role um, and didn't understand that under Agile, the steering committee and the other volunteers acted more as commenters and advisors and observers while decisions were being made by the Agile, uh, the Agile team and some surprising decisions, none of them bad, which I'll explain uh, here in a minute. There wasn't always time for the product owner to wait for steering to round up all the opinions and information needed to keep the project going, at least not under Agile. And that's understanding, or that's understandable, right? Um, we're all on a timeline to meet grant deadlines. We only have two or three years to complete what this grant's paying for. Um, but we didn't all, and it was a, often unknowingly, work to iron out the 
terminological understanding of things from the outset. So what the subtext of all this is clearly is that uh, early defining of what for some parties may be standard workaday roles, uh, but aren't for other parties is key. If we were to do it over, um, we would probably make sure everyone knows exactly what the vocabulary terms we're using mean, possibly even before we got to the meeting. Uh, make sure that stakeholders and developers knew exactly what everyone's role is so that we could you know, focus on what we, we needed to focus our efforts on. And that all sounds simple, but anybody who's been in a big project knows that there are little gaps like that that you need to fill and you can only do it by never stopping the communication around those first two points, defining terms, defining roles. Um, we learned these things and we had to learn them fast and the project is so far proving successful. But some other roadblocks have come up. Um, some were expected and are relatively small in the grand scheme of things. For example, it may not surprise any of you to know that um, some of our uh, user testing, a soft launch of our front facing site um, that's been delayed a little bit so that the, the developers can make it something we can actually test. Also, we minimize the role of EAD3 with just the bare minimum of promised work being done uh, in order to focus on larger, more mission critical developments, such as subject headings. The mess of non-standardized, non sourced metadata was known to us, but the uh, extent of that was not necessarily fully known. Um, Devin Murphy, who I mentioned is gonna present more on this at 11 a.m. tomorrow, be there, please. We also wound up with uh, a requirement of large scale metadata remediation. So imagine if you will, <laughs> 16,000 finding aids encoded in XML, almost all of which were not properly formatted to a greater or lesser degree to migrate into this Taro 2.0 website. Um, our vice chair, Samantha Dodd, uh, who's also on this presentation, will be in the Q&A, um, is presenting on this in more detail at the same time as Devin tomorrow. So go see that if you're interested. But for the purposes of this presentation, this was another instance of large lessons learned. Uh, it was brought to our attention later that um, inconsistent metadata was always going to be a roadblock to success in this project. The, the developers knew this going in to a certain extent because it had happened uh, on similar projects that they'd done. They took it as part and parcel of the process and didn't know the scope necessarily or the, the lack of resources that our repositories would have to update finding aids on this scale. Conversely, the stakeholders knew exactly how few resources our repositories had, but had no idea of the existence of much less the breadth of such a remediation requirement. So months of sometimes strained, but always fruitful negotiation and constant persistent communication ensued um, until we saw one another's viewpoints. Caused us all to sort of dive into the best practice guide that I'd mentioned earlier to parse out which elements and attributes and content within our tags were required and which need to be tossed out so that we could just get these finding aids in the new site. And then on the steering committee side, we wrangled a bunch of volunteers together to serve on an ad hoc subcommittee designed to empower repositories to successfully get their finding aids ready for action. This has been pretty successful thus far, but it is without question, uh, if I were you know just to cherry pick things, and I did, um, it is without question the most mountainous obstacle that we had to climb. Um, so all of you, if, if you got nothing else out of what I just said, in projects like this, know that it is possible, possibly even likely, possible to miss something like this, but it's also possible to identify such overwhelming developments before they happen, uh, to, or at least to plan for sudden resource pivots by everyone involved. Um, people, time, money, there's always something you can put in your hip pocket or toolbox or whatever your favorite metaphor is. Um, you don't have to know what will arise. You only have to separate out those potential resources to, um, to tackle it when it does arise. Um, so you, un you anticipate unexpected requirements. You have a strategy to deal with it. And while we didn't do the first, we lucked out with the latter thanks to some amazing volunteers. So we're tackling that problem. Remediation is going very well. What's next? We just deb debuted our uh, administrative portion of the site, which is gonna replace among other things, our cumbersome FTP file-based upload system. 
Um, and in July, we're going to soft launch the front facing portions of the website. Uh, it's going to be available not just to our repositories, but maybe to patrons and researchers if they need it. And that's where we're going to perform extensive UX and functionality testing. And then happily, we're still on track to deploy the site at the end of September. And then in the long term, we've taken some of these lessons that we've learned uh, from all of this to plan out Tarot's strategic priorities and tasks in the coming years. Um, we have that best practice guide. Our standard subcommittee is working on revising it to better comply with Taro 2.0, but it's also a very technical document that is absolutely amazing at, at what it does, but they're going to look at maybe approaching its content, have it appear more colloquial so that we can onboard new members without overwhelming them with technical documentation. Uh, the new subcommittee I mentioned is going to focus on building off Devin's work to, um, to utilize subject headings in the best possible way. It's going to be tons of trainings and outreach uh, opportunities that dovetail with the Summerlee initiative I mentioned that will hopefully help Summerlee recruit with this shiny new Taro 2.0 website. So I've already covered these lessons learned extensively, but I'm going to uh, recap them very briefly. You just can't ever stop defining. You can't stop defining roles. You can't stop defining terms. If we had it to do all over, I suspect we'd have spent the first hour of that all hands meeting just defining exactly what the roles were and what the terms meant. Um, assumptions were made, all of them based on ignorance, none of them on purpose, uh, because everybody at that meeting was great, still great and talented group of people that are about to pull this huge project off. Um, but we could have used that greatness and expertise, I think, to just suss out these few things that um, that we've had to overcome since then. Then you've heard it before. I, you're going to hear it again it, from me if you ever talk to me. Communication. All project managers know this. Every postmortem, which is kind of what this presentation is, talks about communication. Um, just as with defining roles and terms, constant communication reveals these obstacles in real time and might help you anticipate them too. I bet we could have done better sooner. And uh, next time, if we ever build a website again, we will. Then finally, expect the unexpected, but expect that you could have expected it in the first place. If you just, I bet we could have anticipated the necessity for large scale metadata remediation. Um, so plan, ask questions, replan, mitigate. It's always doable. Now we know it's doable. And although it's a little late in the project, it's a tool we can use next time. So I'm going to close this out by placing a, a list of our volunteers up just for a moment. Um, it's less screen time than they deserve, um, but they do deserve it, as do many others that aren't on here. And I want to thank you for listening to uh, my portion of the presentation, and uh, we'll have a Q&A after Rachel is done. Thanks. Let me get rid of this, Rachel, so you can step in. Thanks, Robert. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, I think everybody can see that. Um, so yeah, I'm Rachel Zipperer. I'm the University Archivist at the University of North Texas. Um, and I also am on the Tarot Steering Committee, although I'm not talking about that today, um, but I'm glad to be here with Tarot folks in this session too. Um, but yeah, what I'm gonna talk about today is our effort here at UNT to build kind of a participatory digital archive through um, the launch of our web application, which is called Keeper. Um, so I'm going to go through kind of what Keeper is, how we developed it, what our goals are for it, um, kind of where we're at now with how people have been using it, and then also go into some of the challenges we've experienced, as well as opportunities and future plans for growing and evolving this project. Um, and I hope that, you know, maybe people might take away if you want to implement something like this at your own institution, um, or if you're doing a similar project, maybe gain something from our like shared experience trying to do this. Um, but yeah, so essentially Keeper is a web application that we developed here at UNT in 2017, which is a little bit before my time here. I started in October 2019. So I wasn't involved with the development of this application, but I have uh, taken over managing the project. So I manage all the submissions to Keeper. Um, yeah, and essentially it's a platform for donating digital materials to the university archive. 
So why did we develop this application? Um, there are a couple of big reasons and then a number of uh, kind of tangential benefits, I think. Um, so number one, we wanted to make it easy to donate digital items to the archive. Uh, so much of what we all create and how we all document ourselves and our activities these days is entirely digital. And in that there is um, kind of a risk that we'll lose things before they make it to the archive that they'll get deleted. Um, so a bit of a, a risk there, we wanted to make it you know, easy to include digital materials in the archive. And then our more philosophical reason um, is that we are a university archive here. So part of our mission is to um, you know, document the history of the university as an institution, but also to include in the archive uh, materials related to campus culture. And probably the biggest part of campus culture is our students and students are documenting themselves digitally. We wanna make it easy for them to share their own stories and experiences in the archive. Um, and then within that, I think uh, kind of a big part of having uh, a platform like this is that we want to invite donors to participate in the archive, both that we want lots of people to contribute um, because if we want to make really a representative archive, we want lots of different kinds of people to share their materials and their voices there. Um, and also through this app, we allow or we invite donors to describe their own materials. So their voices are heard that way as well. It's not all left up to me as the archivist to add metadata. Um, we get to really know uh, context from donors. Um, and because we're working with digital materials, it's much easier to document current events with a platform like this. Um, people can, you know, take a photo on their phone and then donate it through Keeper like a minute later. So uh, we can kind of intercept um, and collect materials that way. And then finally, it's uh, because everything that's uh, donated through Keeper we make available online, we can do that without taking sole custody from the donor. Um, and what I mean when I say that is when people are donating these digital files, it's a copy, like they keep a copy and they give us a copy. So it's different than like with physical materials where we're taking custody of something. And same goes for physical items. If people uh, have a physical item that they want to donate to the archive, but they don't want to part with it, they can take photos of it and submit those digital photos through Keeper. So we can make it available to the public online um, without like taking anything from the donor. So I've kind of sprinkled some uh, examples of submissions we've gotten through Keeper throughout this presentation. And this one I think is a good example of that kind of post custodial model I was just talking about. Um, this is some of the pages of a zine that was submitted through Keeper done by a student named Ashley Allen. Um, and yeah, if I made a zine this cool, I also would not give it to the archive. I would hold on to it, um, but I'm very happy that she took photos and shared them with us that way. I think my favorite part is this kind of gothic uh, Lucky the Squirrel, who's our unofficial mascot featured on that page there. So yeah, this is a little bit more about how Keeper works. Um, this is what Keeper looks like. It's a web application, kind of just like a web form. Um, and it is mobile friendly as well, so people can access this just through a URL, through our website. And it's a pretty simple interface. Users can either drag and drop files or click that little window to upload. And this can be any type of digital file. Um, I'd say most people submit photos, but there are videos, there are audio recordings, like doc files, PDFs, any type of digital file. Um, and the only information we require from donors when they're submitting things through Keeper is their name, their affiliation with UNT, and their email address, so we can contact them. And then when they check that bottom checkbox, um, it agrees to our donor agreement, so we're kind of covered in that way. Um, this is also where we invite that description from the donors. We have just this open text box for description, and we don't give a ton of specific guidance on what should go in this text box. Um, we tell people to start with 
who, what, and where. So sometimes we do get people will just tell us the date that a photo was taken in this box, or they might tell us who's featured in the photo. Sometimes they don't write anything because it's not required. Um, but sometimes they write really insightful um, and contextualizing information there that is, is pretty helpful and cool, I think. Uh, I also wanted to point out, I've presented about Keeper before and people always ask me if it's open source or they can find the code online and you can, it's on GitHub. So I have the link there if you are just curious or you're thinking about implementing something similar at your institution, um, you can find the code online. So the next step after someone submits items to Keeper, uh, they get a confirmation email from me that I received their submission. Um, I do do some kind of like appraisal in some sense to see if the materials are suited for the university archive, if they relate to the culture of the university, um, that kind of thing. Then I accession those submissions. I add the more kind of archivesy standard metadata like titles and dates if I know them and a content description. Um, I also at this point include as a displayed note in the metadata, um, the uh, description that the donor, if they wrote something that they've written in that text box. So verbatim in their own words that shows up in the uh, record when it goes online. So after I add the metadata, our digital projects librarian uploads the submissions and metadata um, where they are then available in the UNT digital library and the portal to Texas history. And there they exist online in perpetuity for anyone with a internet access to access and search and browse. Um, everything from Keeper goes into a collection we created called the University Memory Collection. Uh, so they all live together there if you're browsing, um, they're sorted that way. So these are just some examples of kind of where we're at with uh, how many things have been submitted to Keeper. Um, I'm also glad I'm doing this presentation this year. I was going to do it last year at TCDL before it was canceled. Um, and we now have 500 items in Keeper. And this time last year, I think we only had 200 items. So it's really grown a lot in just the past year. Um, and like I said, most people submit photos, but we have all types of uh, digital records. There are, um, other types of images, digital flyers, videos, sound recordings. And these are just a few examples of things people have submitted. Uh, our donors also are, those students are kind of our target audience. We've received things from alumni, staff and faculty members, um, lots of kinds of people. We also, uh, within the university memory collection, uh, last year when COVID happened and lockdowns started, like a lot of other archives, we kind of put out a call for people to document their experiences of COVID-19 and submit materials to the archive through Keeper. So within that university memory collection, I created a series um, for COVID-19 response. So everything that's COVID related gets sorted together in the digital library that way. Um, and so far we have 261 items in that series. So a little more than half of um, everything that's in Keeper is COVID related. Then in the fall, I also had the opportunity with this, uh, this kind of aspect of the project to partner with a faculty member here at UNT who was teaching a class in the history department called the History of the Present which was a very natural fit to partner with something with Keeper with them. Um, so we did this through a coursework development grant, which is a grant we've offered internally for the last couple of years, um, where we award kind of a small amount of funding to faculty members who want to include special collections materials in their course curricula. Um, so the students in this class both looked at items that were already in this collection and analyzed them from kind of a historian's perspective. And then they also had an assignment to submit materials through Keeper about their COVID experience. Um, so I think, uh, I think about a hundred items that are in this collection were the result of that class assignment. And I wanted to share one example from that class um, that I think is 
I don't know, a pretty poignant example of how we've been uh, working to document people's unique experiences and also how uh, through inviting this participation from donors, we get uh, a lot more context and insight, I think. So this is uh, kind of the basic record of an item that was submitted uh, as part of that class assignment. So Derek Kirby was a student in that class. He submitted this photo of himself holding up his baby daughter to meet his grandmother via Zoom. And we've got our title, we've got kind of our basic um, content description and creator information. But then this next slide, this is what Derek wrote in that open text box is his own description, um, which I don't expect you to read the whole thing. He did write a lot, um, be a lot to read while I'm talking. But yeah, in, in this description, he talks about um, a lot of things that we can't see just from looking at this photo. He tells us about um, his feelings as a student transitioning to all online classes and also not being able to see his family other than via Zoom and being a new parent. Um, and he also tells us that uh, in this particular photo, he you know, had Zoom meetings with his baby before, but this, uh, this particular time was one of the first times she was able to interact with the person on the other side of the screen. So they captured a really special moment here that we wouldn't have known about if Derek didn't tell us. Um, and then, yeah, in that last kind of sentence, he kind of ponders about, um, you know, how he was feeling at the time he submitted this photo through Keeper. Um, this was several months ago. So he's wondering like when there would be a vaccine, when he'd get to see his family again, um, and kind of resigns himself to saying, you know, until that time comes, weekly Zoom meetings will have to do. So re really did capture, I think, almost this description is almost like its own unique archival artifact by telling us how this person was thinking and feeling at the time and adds context to the photo as well. So yeah, that's a little bit about where we're at now with Keeper, um, with how many people have been participating and what kinds of items are there. Um, but we got to that point over the last few years by doing a lot of work to promote the use of this app. Um, I, again, I wasn't here for the development of the application, but um, it does seem like it was developed in this kind of like, if you build it, they will come mentality that we wanted to have this tool in place to then encourage students to use it and to donate their materials. Um, so yeah, before COVID, we did a lot of in-person outreach at any events around ca campus that had tabling. We were there with print materials like business cards and flyers. Um, there were posters that were put up around, uh, around campus to promote this. We also did then and still do use social media to promote Keeper um, and the library website as well. And since COVID is happening, or since COVID has happened, <laughs> I've been doing a lot more virtual outreach events. Um, and also there have been some times that I've done really direct outreach to faculty and student groups and individuals, like that coursework development grants I would consider to be direct outreach where I worked with a specific person on making an assignment for a class. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we're at. And I think this uh, idea of promoting Keeper kind of leads naturally into some of the challenges we've experienced. Uh, so I would say our biggest challenge is kind of correlates to our biggest goal for Keeper um, and that our goal is to create a more representative university archive. Um, and at this point, even though we do have kind of a lot of items in the collection, uh, there has been, I'd say almost like a selection bias in who contributes to Keeper. Um, that like the reality of it is most of the people who have submitted items are associated with the libraries in some way, um, because those are the people who know about Keeper um, and like understand the purpose and that kind of thing. So a lot of people who submit are library science graduate students who also sometimes have extra credit assignments to submit things to Keeper. Um, and then students in the history department now. Uh, yeah, so there's, it, it's not like we've really achieved our goal of getting a good snapshot of university life from a lot of different people. Um, 
although the tool is there and in place. Uh, and within that too, I think like, yeah, the biggest challenge is just getting people to use the app, but also getting them to use it meaningfully. I think a lot of students especially don't necessarily have a good sense of um, what the archive is and what its purpose is or what they could contribute to the archive. Um, so I, I think, you know, may, maybe people have some trouble deciding like what might be relevant to submit and that's a reason they're not using it. But uh, kind of within these challenges, I think there are still lots of opportunities to grow this project and, uh, you know, continue working toward that more representative archive because we do have this tool in place now. And I think the biggest way to do that is just to build relationships with students and other community members, um, which that's a long-term ongoing goal that isn't, you know, I, I don't have a lot of like uh, very concrete answers about how to do that necessarily. Um, but I think that's a long and slow process to establish those lasting relationships. Um, I think one good way to do that is to continue doing this kind of direct outreach. I feel like that um, coursework development grant project was really successful in um, kind of getting students to understand the purpose of donating to, to something like this. Um, and I was able to, I like zoomed into a class session with them to kind of describe the project and answer questions. Um, so I think that worked really well. I'd like to do more projects like that in the future. Um, related, I think doing more just virtual outreach. I've, I've seen a lot of opportunity there in that when we were doing um, just uh, in-person outreach, there was kind of a disconnect where we like hand someone a flyer and expect them to go to a URL. Um, but with virtual outreach and instruction, I can kind of more demystify the process with screen sharing and whatnot. And then I think there was also a great opportunity in uh, collecting around specific themes like this COVID series. Um, yeah, and I would hope to do more things like that in the future. I think that too kind of helps people understand uh, what is relevant to submit and that kind of thing. But that's about all I have to say about Keeper. Um, I do have one final example of our Morrison's corn kit photo, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I think we have time for Q&A. Great. Thank you so much, Robert and Rachel. That was wonderful. Um, I'll go right into our questions so that we have time to get to everyone's. I, I believe this one is for Robert, but possibly both of you. Um, when designing the website in the testing phase, how do you handle accessibility questions in both planning and testing? And that came from Jeffrey here. Yes, and that was my question. <laughs> well put, and it is for both of you. If sure. either of you have any insight, um, my own MSIS degree focused a lot around uh, information architecture and uh, accessibility issues and stuff like that is uh, what I'm, I'm very interested in. And not just accessibility issues for um, people who are the blind or um, uh, have uh, learning disabilities or other things like that. But we try and also to uh, address people whose native language is not English and other things like that. Um, so I'd be interested to hear what both of y'all, uh, how both of y'all plan for those things. Sure. Um, I, I'll take a stab at it, Rachel. I think Rachel knew I was, I was going to be the one who talked. Um, so first off built into uh, the grant at, at the time the recent grant was written i was head of the website and technology committee and our job was to uh, research a lot of the different things that we wanted to include so of course uh, accessibility was was a part of that um, blind colorblind um, other whatever types of challenges people were going to face from an accessibility standpoint um, the developers there at UT Libraries, then you know they they had these requirements that they're incorporating into this. So can I? I don't know that I can get into the weeds. Um, I don't know that I am capable of getting into the weeds of exactly how they're implementing it, but they are. 
and part of our UX testing, which is led by uh, Ada Negraru from, from SMU, who's now the web check chair, um, is going to ensure that all these things got incorporated. When you talk about the language aspect of it, that is actually, um, it's, a, it's a good question, of course. Uh, I'd say that, of course, the finding aids are typically going to be written in English because these are Texas and often collections related to Texas. Uh, there will be portions of it written in Spanish. But um, it's worth thinking aloud on my part that um, ways that we've approached languages, typically the, the understanding, the finding aids will be written in English. Any native uh, materials native to another language will be presented in the inventory and our metadata will document that the different types of language exist so that during searching and browsing, you can find those finding aids that contain that. But I don't know that there's a, a, a I know for a fact, there's no plan beyond that to say, make things that are there in English appear in any other language for now. But man, it's a good question. Um, it's got me thinking, but I hope that answered it. <laughs> and I've just taken some notes for myself, by the way. Yeah, usually what I, I have to do is, is consider uh, how something will affect cultural bias and that, that kind of thing in language. But yeah, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. And yeah, cultural bias in archives is, uh, I could give you three hours on it. I know lots of people who could come tell you about that. Rachel, did you want to add anything to that? Um. I don't think I have much to add to that related to Keeper, but I did want to say that topic about language reminded me a different project that my colleagues at UNT are working on is translating some of our finding aids into Spanish because we are designated as a Hispanic serving institution. So that's an ongoing kind of new project that I am sure my colleagues would be happy to talk about if anyone wants to ask later further. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank um, you. Our next question is, um, once an item is submitted, can the submitter later annotate the submission further? Um, so I'm gonna say yes and no. There's not really like a function within the app for someone to come back to a submission that they've done before. Um, but there have been instances, not very many, but I've had, um, people via email like follow up with me um, if they have I think these instances were like I accidentally like mixed up people's names or something in a description and people have clarified um, so I hope that answers your question it's like yes yeah, not a function within the app but I people once they submit have my contact information and then I am available to go in and edit um, things once they're online <laughs> That makes sense. I was also worried about if there was, how do you do a control system again? And that answers it. You're, you're the control okay, system. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one more question. If anyone would like to enter a question into the Q&A in the Whova app, um, we can we can discuss a little bit further before we wrap up. Meanwhile, I will um, uh, put a couple of interesting things that you guys may want to look at. Um, we have some poster suggestions I am going to try to put it here in the chat for you that, um, here we go. You may be interested in looking at. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, if, if Robert and Rachel, if you have, do you have any final words? I can go ahead and do the wrap up. It looks like there's one more question. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay, Lauren, I may need your help with this one, but it says for submissions to the Keeper app that you have chosen not to include, have you tried getting 
a keeper activity inserted into freshman orientation? Um, I have not specifically tried to get a keeper activity inserted into freshman orientation. Um, yeah, sorry, I was trying to understand the first part of the question about for things sorry. that I've, sorry, not to include, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Oh, sorry, whenever, I, I don't know, when I submitted it, it kind of got munged up. It was actually two questions. Okay. One was um, about submissions that you had chosen not to, to, to include in the archive. I was wondering, like, what were the sort of deciding factors for those? And then separately, I was just wondering if at freshman orientation, you'd done, had people do keepers so they could, you know, get started early in their college career. Yeah, that is a really good idea. We are always looking for, like, places to promote Keeper. Um, it hasn't quite gotten on the orientation docket yet. Um, but yeah, and then as far as um, items that I've chosen not to include, that's happened, I would say, very rarely because the idea behind the university memory collection is just anything related to university culture. So there, it, it's pretty broad. Like um, sometimes I'll get submissions from people who are remote learners who live in different states or something. And I'm like, okay, like it's not our campus culture, but this is, uh, you know, like a student experience, even if they live in Pennsylvania or something. So I'll include that. Um, I think the only times I have specifically not included something are like, sometimes people just use the app I, I don't want to say incorrectly, but like I recently got one where someone submitted photos of the cover of a yearbook and then in their description they were like, can I donate this physical yearbook? So I'm like, I'm not going to include their photos that they were really like inquiring about something instead of trying to donate an item. Um, and I feel like I've gotten a couple of others like that where people will submit like a document that's just a list of websites or something. Um, so there's been some kind of like, not miscommunication, but people aren't really like trying to submit an item. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I very rarely don't include things in the university memory collection unless it's something like that. Thanks. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. I'd like to encourage everyone here to join us for the upcoming TCDL sessions. And please take a look at those poster presentations, particularly the ones that we um, put in chat for you. Here are, um, I also encourage you to participate in our poster scavenger hunt. You can take the quiz online and I put that link in the chat also. Um, and finally, TDL is looking to gauge interest in forming a new member group around research integrity. This is building on the success of our brief research integrity workshop series back in February. We have a survey for you to take, which will help us iron out some details around this group. We'll paste a link, I have pasted a link, into the chat um, and anyone is welcome to take it. So a big round of applause for Robert and Rachel. You guys gave such interesting presentations. Thank you so much for doing this. See you later. Thanks everyone. Thanks, y'all.